Backbreaker stout! And welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Deep Rock Galactic by Mood Publishing and Ghost Ship Games. This game is based on the very popular computer game called Deep Rock Galactic. You can play it on Xbox, Xbox via PC, or Steam if you'd like. And in fact, I've been playing this game for quite some time now, and I love it. So, I randomly one day decided to go ahead and go online and see what other types of things they might have for the game. And I found this. Deep Rock Galactic, Danger, Darkness, and Dwarves, a board game version of one of my favorite video games I've been playing over the last year. And I decided to ask about getting a copy so that I could review it and tell you if it's like the video game and what differences is and whether you should pick up this game if you either A, own the game or B, do not own the video game. So here we go, Deep Rock Galactic, which is a one to four player dungeon crawling experience with a bit of a sandbox feel to it with four unique character classes and a ton of unique upgrades. Delve through the depths of the caverns, gather minerals, gather rocks, gather stones, defeat a bunch of different types of enemy minions or alien monsters, glyphid type creatures, and get out and get back to the drop, pad, uh, the drop pod and escape. Going in each mission, trying something different, whether it be collecting certain types of minerals or guarding certain types of things, and then evacuating. And if you can make it out, you'll survive. However, you'll lose if the game track ends at the very end here, or if all of your dwarves become unconscious. Anyway, that's the basic idea of the game. I'll get into the setup, how to play, and then of course, our review. To begin the game Deep Rock Galactic, the first thing you'll do is decide how many players you're playing with. Based on the number of players is how many dwarves you can bring, and there are four dwarves. You have the gunner, the driller, the engineer, and the scout. And each dwarf has very unique things that they can do, along with the unique actions, as well as the type of weapons they have, and some passive abilities, or active abilities I should say, as well as a, a, a plethora of different types of throwables and rock and stone cards. Uh, you're also going to need to choose a mission, and luckily for you, there is a mission booklet with tons of missions. I think there is a total of 14 different missions in the game, as well as, of course, you can design your own missions as well. And you'll select any mission that you'd like, but if it's the first time you're playing the first mission, you will select number one, I would suggest. Additionally, you'll get to select the difficulty, the hazard level. You can select one, two, three, four, or five. And based on the difficulty, things will happen in the game, as well as this track will move up based on the difficulty, making the game a shorter time frame to complete your objectives. And then after you've selected your mission and the different characters you want to play with, you'll go ahead and start setting up the game boards. A, the main game board is going to be placed on the field. And B, based on the mission in the mission booklet, it will have a layout for you to follow. The layout is going to have different terrain textures that you'll be placing on the board in different areas. And all you have to do is follow the little lights down below. They're like little flares that are going to light up the area. Then you'll be placing certain things on the flares. There are going to be items that you can gather or loot bugs to smash. And you're going to be placing minerals randomly down around the outer edges of the terrain, which is like a way where you can dig through the terrain and acquire the minerals. You'll be placing different types of glyphids, which are basically like alien monster spiders that spawn on the game map that you, you and your other dwarven friends are going to have to deal with throughout the game. And you'll be placing down tunnels. These are spaces where the monsters will spawn throughout the game. After you've placed down all the terrain, all the minerals, any objects that you might be able to pick up, the different monsters, your characters, your drop pod, and the different tunnels, then go ahead and select Molly. Molly is your mule. Molly is what you use to gather minerals and where you place them. Also, if you want, you can go ahead and select one of these ammo refill pods and place it somewhere within reach as well. Down below on the game board is where you've set your difficulty. And like I said, I strongly suggest you start at one, which is the very far left hand side when you begin the game. And then there are four decks you'll place in the game board. One is going to be your event deck. You'll shuffle this up and place it down in the event area. Then you're going to have your swarm deck. Shuffle it up and place it down. If this is your first mission, go ahead and take out the two big scary uh, 
cards in the, in the deck. There's going to be a Praetorian and an Oppressor card that you'll need to take out just to make the game a little easier. Or if you want to challenge yourself, leave them in. You have Rock and Stone cards. These are special actions you can take for free that will do something unique in the game. Place them down after you shuffle them on the same space, as well as you, these cards here. These are your ammo refill cards. You basically shuffle this deck and place it down. These are the cards you'll use whenever you need to determine how much ammo you can refill from one of these little pods. Now your characters. Each character is set up the same way, but also a little different. You're gonna get your main game board, you're going to fill up the left-hand side of all of your different ammo slots. You're going to get the right-hand side, which is going to come with a random secondary weapon that you'll select. And I would strongly suggest you choose a weapon that has a different color die on it and just place it in the slot. You're going to get three ammo instead of the normal five, leaving out the two lock sections. Go ahead and take five HP cubes, the red, and place them in the bottom middle of your board and take the equipment that your character has. Each character has different equipment. So for the, uh, this gunner here, you're gonna be getting uh, these guys here. These are little grapple hooks. Uh, they're called zip lines. And this one here is a shield and you'll place them down on the character so that they, you know that they have them. The driller has all the same things, except the driller is going to get a bunch of fire tokens. Uh, the scout will get flares that are going to light up the area, giving you a benefit when you throw them on the field. And the engineer is not only going to get a turret that will actually hit enemies as they come into reach or into play and into sight, but also you'll get these platforms that you'll be able to place down on the field, allowing you to get from one place to another. Sending you in alongside a heavily armed lift to get as many out as possible. We're picking up extreme fire signs in the area, so keep it snappy. And the other thing that you're going to do in the game, after you set up the main game boards, is on the sides. You're going to be getting one throwable item from the deck that you draw, and one random rock and stone card from the deck that you draw. Place the throwable on the left-hand side, and the rock and stone card on the right. Then, you're pretty much ready to go. I strongly suggest you take out all the tokens in the game and set them aside. There's damage markers, extra health, extra ammo. There are these upgrade tokens that you'll be using in the game, and etc., etc. along with this bag where I keep most of all the gems. And if you want, you can set aside all the minis in the game as well. These are gonna come on the field throughout the game, so you should have them already, as well as all the dice. And of course, this. This is your hostile creature of hoxes, um, and it tells you all the different types. And there's, it's double-sided, and it'll start with the weakest one, which is the grunt, and it'll move down all the way to the scariest ones, the Praetorian and the Oppressor. And after you've got all that set up, um, you're pretty much ready to go. The only thing that I would remind you of is that when you place the drop pod, which is told on the mission book, you're gonna place each character on their space, which is based on their color, and you can check your color based on your player mat. So if you're playing the gunner, it's a green character and it'll go in the green space. And the same will be said for every other character. And if you're playing with less than four players, just simply remove all the things that those players have and you'll play the game just the same way. So it works no matter how many players you have. And if you have a single player variant, you actually will use Bosco. Bosco is kind of like a AI character that will help you throughout the game. Anyway, that's how you set it up. There's quite a lot, but it's actually quite simple. Lock and load, lad. Welcome to Deep Rock Galactic and how to play. I'll explain most of everything, but I won't get into de detail about everything. So you'll have some stuff that you can look up as far as maybe line of sight works or specifically how and where each of your characters can do certain things like their special actions that they have. But I'll let you know most of everything. And we'll go ahead and just get started by looking at the back of this rule book here. The back of the rule book will show the turn summary. There are two phases. You have the action phase and you have the event phase. After one character takes both of these uh, phases into account, it will go to the next player, and the next, and the next, and then it'll pass back to the first player. And if you're playing with lesser players, then you'll just simply carry the rules out and then move to the next player, and you can just go back and forth in that way. The action phase allows you to carry out three actions. You can take any number of these actions up to three times, which means you can take the same action multiple times if you'd like. There's a variety of actions in the game. You can move, attack, use your pickaxe, throw your specific throwables, you can overclock your secondary weapon, resupply, exchange supplies, assist slash revive other characters, and you can play a rock and stone card, which is a free action and doesn't count towards your three. 
Action one is move. If I'm playing as the gunner, I can move three spaces. Any player can move three spaces, and that is how movement works. You would go one, two, three. And as you move along the game board, you're going to have to take into consideration anything such as the walls of the game, which are the blank spaces, spaces that have little tokens on them, and when you move adjacent to them, they will become revealed. And you're also going to take into consideration any stalagmites and enemies. You can never stay on a space that has an enemy or a stalagmite. Certain things you cannot move through, like stalagmites and walls, and other things you can move through as long as you don't land on their space, like for instance, another one of your allies. Or something like this guy here, your little pod, or uh, anything, anything else like a turret. Uh, and after you have moved, that would take your action. That would be one of your actions. You could choose to move again if you'd like by spending another uh, three movement points for that one action. And that would be it. Um, you cannot move through areas that are blank, obviously, and you cannot move across spaces that have these black, darkened holes. They're basically just like pits to nowhere. So be aware of that. The next action is attack. And attack is quite simple. When you are playing, so if I've moved my gunner two spaces and I moved him another, or three spaces and I moved him another three, I can attack with him, right? Well, I can use his primary weapon or his secondary. The secondary is the one I chose at the beginning of the game, and the primary is the one he comes with. And if you'd like, at the beginning of the game, you can select a different primary for your character. So for instead of the powered minigun, I could use the Thunderhead Heavy Auto Cannon. But we'll just simply select the base one here. And I'm going to choose my primary instead of my secondary. There are two main things on your guns. A, how many dice you get and the color of those dice, and B, the range. Range is how far away you can hit something, and the dice is how much damage you're going to do. There is line of sight, and line of sight works like most dungeon crawlers, where you'll take a piece of string and you will point it in a direction, and as long as nothing blocks your view, like a stalagmite, or like a wall, or like other enemies, then you can go ahead and shoot and hit the target. So for instance, if I wanted to, I could select the, the enemy next to me, I would be able to take these three dice, and because they're within range, I will be able to fire, and I will roll the dice. Each of the dice's dice, certain uh, sides are going to have pips. These pips could involve a fire, or an explosion, or a pickaxe, or it could be a bullet, and they all do the same thing. They do one damage for each one that you have. You will then assign your dice doing damage. One die can only be assigned to one space, but each additional die can be either on the same space or an adjacent space. So for instance, with this, I could go ahead and move one damage onto the first grunt, could move another damage onto the second, which is in an adjacent space, and the third, which is blank, I could move onto the last grunt, which is going to do no damage. I could also choose, if I needed to, if multiple, if multiple monsters had higher health, I could assign all three on the same space, or I could assign two on one and one to an adjacent space. It's really dependent on the monsters you're fighting, or the glyphids. I would then check this wonderful board here. This board will determine whether or not you do damage. First, you have the character, of how much health it has, how much range it has, and how much movement. At the bottom, it tells you what dice you're going to be using, which is the, the creature dice, and it will have specific rules. Like for instance, the grunts are kind of weak. They get one die, and if it's, a question, if it's an exclamation mark, it'll have no effect unless you're playing on the difficulty hazard five, in which case it does, making them a little stronger. And grunts do not have any resistance. So each grunt having one health would die for one bullet, meaning you would kill two of the three grunts. If you're fighting something scarier like the Exploder, you cannot use uh, one single red die on them. So when I roll, if I were to roll, I don't know, my experimental plasma charger and I roll and I get a hit, what will happen is I'll get an exploding red symbol and I'll check resistances. And for each symbol on the resistance, I'll have to add a die there. Every additional die will then do damage. In which this case, he might only have one health, but he resists red, so this would resist this damage. But if I were to target it with my gunner here, it would just blow up. And that being said, certain characters do different things, certain creatures. The exploders will blow up when they are, they've been detonated. They're also able to roll damage, which explodes. The grunts are gonna be using the bites, and so will the red web spitters. And there's a ton of information about how each of the characters work, which I'll explain more in the review. But just so you understand how fighting works and how attacking works, that's pretty much the gist of it. If you don't want to attack or you're done attacking, you can simply move on to the next action, which is pickaxe. And stop! Combat positions. The swarm is here. Pickaxe is pretty cool, so if I'm going to play as the driller now because I moved two times and I attacked with the gunner, I can then go ahead and move the driller. So I can go 
one, two, and three, and I just move them to a space. And there's a few things you can pickaxe. A, the first thing that you can pickaxe is a creature. And how that works is you take the pickaxe die, and you take the pickaxe action, and you save ammo, and you roll this. And, <clears throat> oh, I should mention too, whenever you use a gun, each time you use it, you spend an ammo from your reserve. I, that's pretty clear, but I didn't say it, so yes, whenever you use anything, that require that has ammo that requires ammo you must spend the ammo but pickaxes do not require ammo when you roll them you'll get either a one pickaxe a two or you'll get a zero <laughs> which is highly un unlucky for you and you'll do damage you'll do one or two damage to a monster that's adjacent to you because pickaxe pickaxes have a range of one or you could pickaxe things like these stalagmites. When you pickaxe them, they'll explode and you'll roll the loot die and hopefully get something good like either gold or nitra. Or you could pickaxe uh, something uh, that is empty, so a space that's blank. And when you do, you'll be able to place one of these tiles there. Not only that, but if you rolled two pickaxes, you could choose two adjacent spaces to use the pickaxes on. I could, for instance, with one pickaxe action, and I get a roll of two, I can pickaxe a stalagmite, bursting it open, and I could also dig into the wall, which will also let you get certain places, and your team as well. Or I could hit a grunt, and then a stalagmite, or two grunts. It's really up to you with this wonderful little pickaxe. The other thing that pickaxes will do is they will burst op op open things like loot bugs. So if I had a loot bug here, which has a little pickaxe symbol on it, I can hit that, and I will get uh, some good stuff. I can get the loot die and a bonus gold whenever I hit those little guys there. And that's pretty much how pickaxes work. They can do anything in, the game, in, the, in this game that you would typically do in the video game. Bursting open baddies, uh, killing the, uh, the loot bugs, you could destroy the stalagmites, and you could enter the, uh, you can basically kind of sand, uh, you can sandbox your way to certain areas in the game. Okay, next action, throwables. Well, you'll simply use your throwable and you'll do what it says. It's a discard item, you'll roll the dice, apply the highest result to a single target when you're using this impact ax, and it has its range on it as well. It functions just like a weapon does, but instead of using ammo, you use the card. Overclock your secondary weapon. If you have stored a goal, uh, you are going to be able to upgrade this, exp uh, uh, you can upgrade these secondary cards. And the way you do that is you flip them over. So they start on one side, which is the, the uh, the green the green side and they flip over to the red side so it looks like this and they flip over to this and if you use a gold and the action you'll be able to do that not only that but how do you get the items while well, pickaxing is one of the ways if you pick the axe into a space that has loot you will take that loot um, whenever you're taking something that is pickaxed, you can take it from an adjacent space. Whenever you take something that is just an item on the ground you have to be on the same space and you don't have to stop movement either so that is how you were going to overclock Resupplying. Resupplying is going to cost you three nitra, which is like your ammo type gems, or it can be any combination of nitra and gold up to three because gold is kind of a wild resource when it comes to resupplying yourself. Um, when you spend those three, you'll be able to drop this little guy here, this resupplier down anywhere on the board that is applicable. If you already have it on the board, or when you place it on the board, I should say, you'll flip over one of these cards here, and this will give your team ammo. This is basically, you'll put it next to the, the, the pod in some way, and you will add the ammo uh, that you're going to have. So in this case, it has seven of the first type of ammo, and then it's going to have four of the secondary ammo, and it'll have one HP. And it'll be placed there. Whenever somebody uh, goes over here, they can use an action, which is also the resupply action, to simply take whatever they want here and put it back on their game board. So you can be greedy or not, and you can choose what you want to take. Die, worthless, Feel much better now. Action. Exchange supplies. You can exchange ammo with other players in the game. There's a few other things you can exchange as well. But if you're adjacent to somebody, you can just simply exchange stuff with them. Can't exchange health, though. Assist and revive. You are able to assist or revive a character who has been knocked down or is exhausted. If you get knocked down, it's from an effect. If you get exhausted, it's because you have no health. When you spend an action and you're adjacent to somebody, you can go ahead and get them back up and they're gonna stand back up when they are knocked down. If they're exhausted, they will stand back up, but with one HP. 
then you can go ahead and play Rock and Stone cards, which are for free. You're just simply gonna go ahead and play the cards, do what they say, and discard the cards. The last thing that you can do is actually not on here, but it's whenever you fall over for any reason, maybe a meteorite comes and hits, hits you, and you go, ah, oh, and you fall backwards, or something like pushes you, Normally you have to spend two action points to get back up, which is why you'd rather have an assist because it will only cost that player one action as opposed to you spending two of your three actions just to get back up. And those are pretty much all the actions in the game. And the main ones you're going to be using are pretty simple. It's going to be the moving, and it's going to be the shooting. When you run out of ammo, you're gonna resupply. When you need to get to a certain area, you are then going to carve out a path on the game board that's empty, and people can get through that way. Um, and then you have secondary uh, type of actions that are specifically listed on your character boards. Like for instance, the gunner can do a zipline action. For an action, he can place out zipline tokens across the map in certain ways or let players get from one side to another with a simple movement point. Or the shield generator, throwing a shield generator in an adjacent space and covering that space and all spaces adjacent to that shield with a shield protecting you from taking damage and uh, grunts not being able to hurt you or come into there if they're not in there already. And so it's a nice like protective spell. But at the end of this turn, when it goes back to your turn again, the shield will go away and you won't get back until you resupply. And there's more. There's turrets that can be deployed. There are platforms that can be deployed. Your team is getting bigger. Wolf inbound. There are special flares that get deployed that will allow you rerolls on attacks if you're adjacent to it on the same space. So there's a bunch of other bonus actions that you can take in the game, as well as an area of effects and whatnot. But other than that, that's how you play the main actions in the game. The final thing is quite simple. It's the event phase. And how that works is simple. You draw the card with the arrow. You read the card with the arrow. You do what it says. Sometimes the card will simply say to place out monsters and it make those monsters act. Other times the card is going to say to move the tracker a certain number of spaces and then make monsters act. Basically it's moving monsters and acting with them, which is either moving or attacking, making the uh, turn tracker move fast, the, the way you lose the game, move across the board, um, or simply spawning monsters. And basically what happens is the monsters will get spawned and most of the time they're going to activate. And activating monsters is very simple. They do one of two things. They will either attack if they can attack and they are in range, or they will move if they can't attack and are not in range. So in this case here, if I had a monster next to my gunner here, the monster would attack. The other two are not close enough, so they would move. And that would be exactly it for the monsters. And you are going to do them based on the lowest monster all the way to the highest monster, the weakest to the strongest. And they will interact based on what this board says. They will, you look at their attacks, you will roll mainly their bite dice and do what they say. Some monsters are special and they'll spawn in certain areas and some have unique abilities or are a little bit bigger than others, but they all function the same way, move or attack. And if they're in range, they're simply going to attack. They're going to go to the dwarf that's closest or if there's a tie, the dwarf who most recently acted. And basically how I ever say with monsters and dungeon crawlers is do the most detrimental thing that they can do against your party because that's typically how it would work in the game. After you have drawn this card here and done what it says, you're gonna to have to take note because you might hit a swarm section on this track here. These swarm sections are little grunts, glyphid grunts that are on uh, the board and there's one, two, three, four, five, six of them. Each time you hit one of those, you will draw one of these cards here and you will do what it says. It's gonna be more nastiness, like placing three grunts at an exit and exploder uh, at another exit and then activating all creatures. And these are all the big scary ones coming to play. Monsters will typically spawn as well in these areas here. They're like tunnel areas. You always place them on the tunnel, and if that's blocked, adjacent to the tunnel. And uh, you keep placing them as close to the tunnel as humanly possible. If you run out of monsters of a certain type, then you're gonna place down grunts instead of those monsters. And if you run out of those as well, then you're basically uh, screwed enough as it is, so nothing will spawn. And then that's it. You'll rinse and repeat, you'll go to the next player. He'll take his three actions, he will draw this card, he will do what this card says, check to see if there's a swarm, if there is, draw this card, if not, pass, and continue playing the game. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna try and complete the mission. In the first mission of the game, it's quite simple. You are going to need to find these Apaka Blooms, they're basically little flowers, and you're gonna to need to put them in the molly for each one that you step on. You're also going to need to get to certain areas on the board that are going to have more kite. You'll need to mine that area out and when you do, you'll get the Morkite and you'll put it in the Molly. When you've gained the Morkite and the Apaka Blooms that you need, all your characters will need to go back to the drop pod and they can go in any space that they'd like. And once they do, they are going to be done and they will escape. Reloaded. Rock 
for rock and stone. stone! Rock and stone forever! Action commencing. Good work. Rock and stone! If they all get knocked down before that, game over. If this track goes all the way across, game over as well. And whenever you end, uh, uh, end your turn inside this drop pad, after it's come back when completing the mission, you won't have to draw any more of these cards anymore. However, if you got knocked down because you run out of health, you are, instead of taking your turn, going to just um, simply move this tracker over and pu push this forward, which is just going to make the game uh, quicker, but you're not going to get that turn until somebody can revive you. So make sure you get those revives as quickly as possible. I think I pretty much explained everything there is to explain in this game. Um, there is some more things like you can upgrade your weapons, which I'll talk about in the review and different types of items and whatnot. But as far as this game goes, it's a dungeon crawler with a sandbox experience, allowing you to move uh, characters from one side of the board to another, gathering objectives, completing them and succeeding in Deep Rock Galactic. Okay, is this game good though? So Deep Rock Galactic is a dungeon crawler game at its core. If you've played games like Descent, then you will probably understand how Deep Rock is played, and there's quite a few in this genre. What makes Deep Rock a different game in this manner is your ability to sandbox the cave, being able to go from one portion of a cave to another portion of a cave, being able to zip line across the empty holes, and of course being able to blast enemies using special abilities and special weapons that you can upgrade throughout each mission is what makes this game quite special. Additionally, each mission is separate and you can go ahead and bring whatever you'd like, being able to customize your character before you go, and thusly, there's no progression system in this game other than difficulty level. Additionally, in this game, you're mainly going to be collecting objective items and bringing them back to the drop pod. Uh, after you've gathered them into your mule and escaping before time runs out. Whereas in the video game, there's a few other specific events like protecting the drill dozer and making it across, or mining more kite with a refinery. And those are not in this game. This is mainly a go and get what you need and get out in time while dealing with mission specific events and certain items that you may need throughout the game while more and more monsters spawn, while you're choosing your hazard difficulty level to make it more challenging, and basically a pick up and deliver type system. Additionally, each mission is unique in its own way and has a ton of different tiles that you can use to select different variants of play, and thusly creating new triggers and responses that will engage you throughout the game. Games might include upgrades that will give your, 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 your guns specific extra dice or extra range that you'll be adding to your guns based on if they're overclocked or not, or what spaces are available on your game board. You're always going to be wary of your health, how you want to utilize your character, and how much damage and ammo that you can take and give. Additionally, in this game, you're basically going to be going through a very straight, systematic approach. You're going to take your actions, you're going to draw a card, you're going to do what the card says, and then you might draw another card and do what that card says as well. But otherwise, you have free reign on the map. You might want to place down a flare as the scout and put it in between a bunch of these grunts, and then use the gunner to blast them all down with bonus rerolls, making it easy to do so. There's a ton of different monsters in this game that are all represented in the video game as well. You've got spitters and exploders, and you've got the Mactera spawns, you've got slashers, you've got Praetorians, you've got oh, all kinds of stuff, brood nexuses, and a ton of beautiful components. This is the deluxe version of the game, to my knowledge, and I strongly recommend this is the one you pick up because these are wonderful. All of the extra pieces are great. I love the fact that they made miniatures out of all the items that you'll be using in the game, even if they're not even fully functional, like this mule is mainly just a container, but it's so integral to the game. Uh, the idea of how drop pods work and the ammo that you can get and how they customize this all to fit into the game, giving it that feel of time is running out, that feel of not only is time running out, but you also have to make your dwarves get to a location and back, utilizing the skills and special actions of your dwarves. And remember, you're limited too. There's only a certain number of nitro and gold that you can mine throughout the game, and only a limited supply of supply pods that you'll be able to drop down, thusly expending too much ammo on creatures that are not 
necessarily non-resistant to you can be detrimental and you could basically not be able to destroy stuff as much as you'd like. You could get swarmed upon and make things challenging. Sometimes events will pop up that might not be as beneficial to you or it might be a pretty casual walk in the park. And that really depends on not only the luck of the draw, but also your hazard level and the type of monsters you're dealing with throughout the game. I am a huge fan of Deep Rock Galactic, the video game. And I'm also a huge fan of the board game as well. Now, while I do wish that this game had more types of objectives that you could do other than going and gathering the components and bringing them back, I feel like the core aspect of the video game is enshrined in this game. Going out, out and gathering the Morkite, gathering the blooms, smashing the different types of loot bugs, being able to deal with the swarms and how they pop out of the walls, how they can walk across the cave edges where you can't because they're bugs and they crawl everywhere. The idea of using the pickaxe to fight things when you need to is great when you run out of ammo. So you're never constantly screwed to the point where you can't do anything. Little things like the engineer's turret activates whenever enemy moves or spawned within range and it just simply does damage and it blasts little things quite easy, but the big things are difficult. And the more difficult the things are, the more resistance they have, the more challenged they are to defeat. Sometimes you might not want to defeat an enemy. You might just want to leave. If you guys can escape and there's a ton of stuff on the field, that does not matter. Killing enemies is not relevant, but there are some enemies that will provide you with bonuses if you do beat them, if you want, which you don't have to do. And if you want to outrun them, it's possible you can do that as well. I love sandbox games. This one does the game a great justice. I am so impressed with the idea of how this works, being able to platform areas with my engineer, my scout shooting those flares out, they benefit in some way because in general, the game, the video game with flares, when you light up an area, it's easier to see. And in this game, how do you represent that? Well, now you get to reroll on, on your dice if you miss, which means you're more accurate, which means you can see better. Super smart, great choice of mechanics. The flamethrower from the driller drops flames out and can burn enemies as they come. Or the gunner. Gunner is able to take an action and shoot, and if they want, instead of spending another action to shoot, which I didn't explain in the example, they can just simply shoot again and expend more ammo. And they can do any subsequent actions that are always shoot, 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 shoot for free. But when you run out of ammo on a gunner, which happens a lot, you're gonna have to resupply. And you might, be an, uh, you might be an ammo hog if you're not too careful. I love the idea of playing these rock and stone cards and you're being limited to them quite vastly. You only get a certain number of them and you need to use them at their best moments, just like the throwables. Very strong, but single use. The spawn cards are fun. When a big monster hits play, you feel the big monster hitting play. They spawn in areas where you're typically going to have to deal with certain things, and the maps are made so that way when you go across them, stuff is always going to be upon you. Even the most basic, simple version of the game, which we played, uh, we played the level one, uh, hazard one difficulty, and it was still a lot of fun. It still felt like certain moments were dangerous, and other moments were all about planning and trying to execute your dwarves to get to the locations that had what you needed to get and get back. And so it's a constant mix of puzzly and shooting and acquiring what you need and getting out within the time period. The dice are beautiful. The art is wonderful. They did the game high amount of justice in this as well. Double thick player boards, the board itself, the different pieces that you can align to make territories as well as being able to design your own missions Great. I love the fact that the minis are so detailed. There's so many different tokens used throughout the game. And all I keep hoping for is more of it because this is great. I've only played about three or four missions so far, but I'm pressed to play more. And I wanna make my own as well for the next time my friends come over. And what I'd really like to see in this game, like I said, is more mission types. That's the one gripe I have. I want to move the drill dozer and I want to be a part of that experience that is in the video game. I want to experience mining things and being able to drop pods down or, or like pipes down and connect them to more kite miners that pull in and I have a certain amount of time to gather this stuff. And the enemies are not only against me, but against, there's just a lot of stuff they can do. And they can do this. And based on the success of this game, hopefully there's gonna be more, even more. I mean, this game already has a lot. So really I am complaining over a small, super small detail, but I just loved how much, how well this this game did with just this this typical type of scenario, which is the gathering part. I'm really hoping that they can do something even more with the other parts, but we'll just have to wait and see. But as it stands, Deep Rock Galactic is a solid pickup. If you own the video game, the difference between this and the video game is the experiences that you're going to have. Rock and stone! Rock and yeah. stone, everyone! 
This is not as much of a time crunch. You're just basically making the best choices possible with the amount of time that you need. And the video game is gonna be constant rush, constant pressure. This is more like a small buildup of tension and then a release and then a small buildup all while being able to decide the best moves possible within the time that you are allowed. Overall though, this is a great game regardless of whether you played the video game or not. I am going to be keeping this game in my collection. It's going to see probably my top 10 games of the year unless something takes it down because I think it's already in the top 5 right now. That's how much I like this game. I am a fan of dungeon crawlers and this one does them a great service. I am excited to see what other games this company comes out with because yes, I, I'm giving this my seal of approval. This was a wonderful experience. I had almost no issues with pretty much any of the rules, but if you do, there's also a link where they detail another FAQ, which I'll link down below in the description. But yes, Deep Rock Galactic, pick it up. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Deep Rock Galactic. If this piqued your interest, which I bet it did, go ahead and check out the link down below in the description where you can go ahead and pick up the game. People are getting them right now from the Kickstarter and I am enthralled. You can also go and check out our website, unfilteredgamer.com, blog posts, giveaways, Kickstarter lists, and more. Don't forget, if you've seen more than one of our videos and you've liked at least one or more, go ahead and subscribe. Do us a favor if we've earned your subscription and push the button. See our videos if you want to, see them whenever they come out, use the bell notification button. But either way, just clicking it does help us out. It shows that people are interested that we're making content and that you'd like to see more and hopefully I did a good job explaining the games that I do review here. That's pretty much all I got for you this time guys and as always I look forward to Rock and Stone Ing with you next time.